So what we're going to do now is I'm going to uh, introduce our first presenter today. And actually, I'm going to change over to uh, make Adam Gilmore the presenter, and then Adam can start showing his screen. Uh, so Adam is the uh, product manager for the fluorescence products based at our Edison, New Jersey office. And uh, he's going to begin today's presentation. And uh, unless uh, there's any other notes from the audience, which I don't see at this time, I'm going to turn over to Adam to begin the presentation here. Well, thank you very much, Mark and Jeff. Yeah, this is uh, Adam Gilmore speaking. Um, it's my very great pleasure to uh, talk to you today about a, uh, one of my favorite topics in uh, our instrument line. Basically, what I'm going to be talking about today is, is uh, the complementary size and aspect ratio analysis of single wall carbon nanotubes. And the method or technique of, of uh, the subject today is the photoluminescence excitation emission mapping. And essentially, uh, you know, the, the entire uh, premise of today's talk, again, focuses on, on the multidimensional aspects uh, and information we can get out of this uh, photoluminescence excitation emission mapping technique. Now this is a, a picture of me and my wife. I, I realize you didn't see me at the beginning of the slideshow. And this isn't actually a Christmas tree. This is a, a patriotic tree at the uh, courthouse in Newark, New Jersey, where my wife here received her citizenship about a year ago. Congratulations. Um, first thing, yes, thank, thank you very much. Uh, first thing I like to start off with, of course, is, is this slide, because I think it's you know visually very interesting. But there are several. Uh, other aspects about this that I like to point out and that in terms of, of understanding the structure and functional relationships of, of what we call single wall carbon nanotubes and a, a single wall carbon nanotube as I'll emphasize throughout the talk is, is simply a tubular form of graphene basically where it's rolled up and again the structure and function of the um, carbon nanotube has a lot to do with the basic molecular structure and direction and what we call the helical twisting of the graphene sheet as it rolls up into various types of, of single wall carbon nanotubes. And the three major forms of single wall carbon nanotubes that are of interest uh, that, that exist, basically there's three main families of carbon nanotubes. And you'll have to defer, you know, uh, forgive me for the Japanese here, but I just wanted to point out is that Carbon nanotubes could either roll up so that they're completely parallel for all the graphene structures, the graphene unit cells that you'll see here. There could be a subtle twisting, and there could be a more dramatic twisting. And there's, this represents three families of carbon nanotubes, as I'll uh, illustrate in the rest of the talk. So for those of you who like fruit roll-ups, uh, best way to think of graphene uh, carbon nanotubes is a uh, single wall carbon nanotubes or a graphene roll-up. And a couple key things about the structure and function here, in a little bit more detail, of course, you see the graphene sheet here. And a single wall carbon nanotube basically um, can be formed by rolling up a, a certain what we call length, which is this, this directional vector here. And that directional vector determines what we call the, you know, the, the circumference or the diameter uh, aspect ratio of a single wall carbon nanotube. And so there's actually a very interesting mapping convention associated with the nomenclature for single wall carbon nanotube species. And that happens to be based on uh, a quadratic uh, equation, which I won't go into in, in too much depth here. But needless to say that there are two parameters here of interest and, and that are used to define an individual carbon nanotube species with respect to this roll-up circumference. And the first has to do with what they call the horizontal graphene unit cells. Then you have the vertical unit cells. So you have a, a 10 comma 5, which means that there are 10 horizontal cells and 5 vertical cells. These are otherwise known as the N comma M uh, characteristics of the carbon nanotube. And so another key aspect of the nanotubes has to do, as we'll explain uh, in the future, the, the angle between this horizontal position and the, the 
vector that determines the roll-up direction and, and circumference. And again, as you as will explain, the angle and the, uh, the direction of the roll-up and the NM characteristics are really what define the, the key structure functional relationships of the molecules that, that we know as single wall carbon nanotubes. So as I mentioned before, there are three major families of single wall carbon nanotubes and each family is, is basically very significant. Um, we, we generally look at the two families that, that exhibit either a slight or a more dramatic twist. Um, we lump those into one family, it just so happens, that we call a, a semiconductor family. And semiconductors, uh, as, as with any bulk semiconductor material, exhibit photo and or what we call electroluminescence, and we'll get into the, the mechanisms behind that. So that means that they can take part and be, uh, you know, basically um, associated with, with transistors uh, that they basically have um, depending on their, their NM characteristics, very precise band gap, and that this is very useful for, you know, various types of device and biological and chemical sensing engineering. And basically, as, as I'll explain, as uh, is, is becoming more and more of a hot news item, the, the single wall carbon nanotube uh, semiconductor materials can actually be used to generate very, you know, effective and, and highly dense transistor networks. Um, the other third are, are the metallic species. Now the thing about the metallic species is that they're actually invisible to photoluminescence and electroluminescence. They act as metals, they're highly conductive thermally and electrically, and they can act as efficient conductors. And some of the key applications here are that they facilitate the, the formation of what we call transparent conductive films. And this is often associated with enhanced efficiency for photovoltaic materials. And, I'll be discussing some of those applications as I move along. Um, so I just wanted to point out that of the past year, there's been a number of very exciting developments. And I'm not going to go into detail here because I saved hopefully the best for last at the end of the, the presentation. But several key things having to do with um, the ability to use and sterilize single wall carbon nanotube materials for medical applications roles in, you know, in, in device manufacturing as a way of protecting against damaging heat flows, um, ways of enhancing photoacoustic imaging, replacement of the ITO in solar cells. This is a big topic. A very interesting topic having to do with the ability to generate a paint that actually senses uh, through the photoluminescence spectral emission, as we'll explain, cracks and things associated with, you know, aircraft uh, skins and things. And probably the most important and exciting is the, the potential role the single wall carbon nanotubes are expected to play in, in Moore's law, where the um, rate of, you know, basically computing and transistor speed is supposed to, you know, double every uh, uh, predictable, uh, every so, so many years here. Okay, so there's a few other things that I'll get into here at the end too, and that has to do with there's uh, a lot of interest in understanding how separation in nanotubes influences their structure in terms of forming defects, um, how certain sizes of nanotubes can actually be flattened and act as, as uh, in a graphene-like manner. And I think some of the, the more important uh, research has also been focused on um, the chiral selection and the, the selective isolation of these individual carbon nanotube species. Of course, that's really important for almost all applications of carbon nanotubes because you need to know which species you have in order to understand the band gap uh, parameters. So just a little uh, primer here on, on photoluminescence and, and what we're measuring with single wall carbon nanotubes. Uh, now I've told you what I'm going to tell you and I'm, now I'm going to tell you and at the end we'll, we'll recap everything here, is that photoluminescence is basically whenever light is emitted from a material because it has absorbed light previously. And in particular, the semiconductor photoluminescence has more to do with the materials, uh, uh, what they call um, band gap energy level. So light is actually emitted um, across the, the band gap energy level when the excitation of light is actually higher than the band gap energy level. 
of course, there'll be some, some more illustrative uh, examples or uh, explanation of this phenomenon. But what I want to get to is in terms of, of nanotubes and nanomaterials, there's a key um, principle that, that defines the relationship between a nanoparticle's physical diameter and its band gap energy. And the, key, the, the, the essence of it is, is what they, they call the Bohr exciton radius. So any bulk semiconductor material can be defined uh, with a physical distance in, in actual nanometers, which represents the distance between the electron and the hole across the band gap. Okay, so the, the, the significance of that is, is that in nanomaterials, it's often the case, as with single wall carbon nanotubes and quantum dots and other materials, that the actual diameter of the particle itself is smaller than this physical Bohr exciton radius in size. And so what actually happens is that there's a, a confinement of the quanta, such that the smaller the particle diameter becomes, smaller than the Bohr exciton radius, then the higher the energy of the band gap, meaning that you need to absorb light of higher energy, um, and that you also emit or photoluminesce at a, across a higher energy level. So all that being said, I think this, this particular slide is actually one of the key slides to understanding the, the um, rest of the talk and the applications. And a couple key things about this slide is that a carbon nanotube, as we explained, has a very high what we call aspect ratio. And so that's a significant portion of this talk is that the aspect ratio of, of a carbon nanotube is basically its diameter versus its length. And it just so happens that the diameter is so much smaller than the average length, as we'll explain, that it's the diameter dimension that actually confines the quanta. And so this quasi one-dimensional confinement of a carbon nanotube relative to its exciton bore radius basically leads to the observation or the, the phenomenon known as the Van Hove singularities, which we represent here as V2 and V1. So it's best to, to view these what we call valence electron states as the light absorption bands. And the light absorption bands have very sharp peaks in terms of what we measure in terms of photoluminescence. And then in the excited state, basically, we have our conductance bands. And there's actually resonance between the V2 and the C2 transition and V1, C1 transitions, as we'll show in, in further slides. But the essence of it is, is that the smaller a nanotube gets in principle, the larger the band gap gets. And that changes both the V1 and V2 energy levels and the C1 and C2 energy levels across this band gap. So smaller diameter nanotubes have a larger band gap energy than, than, narrow, uh, than, than larger diameter nanotubes. And so in principle, what we're, what we're getting to is, is the observational significance of, of this behavior. And it turns out, of course, carbon nanotubes absorb light in the ultraviolet. They absorb light uh, with, with three major bands, let's say. One is in the ultraviolet, one is basically in the visible near-infrared, and one is entirely in the near-infrared, as we'll show. However, for the photoluminescence technique that, that is commonly applied, and, and uh, is, is the convention now um, in, in you know, the modern use of photoluminescence for characterizing carbon nanotubes, we're primarily concerned with an absorption band known as the V2C2 band. And the photoluminescence of carbon nanotubes is, is basically, as we mentioned before, for semiconductors, it's a band gap edge emitter. So all photoluminescence comes from the C1 to V1 transition. So you absorb in the visible from V2 to C2, and then there's a, a, a basically a electron hole rearrangement. And as the electron hole crosses across the band gap, basically the, the recombination leads to the emission of a near infrared um, photon. So we'll just repeat that again because again, as we'll be pointing out in these in these maps that we'll be showing, it's the absorption in V2 and C2 and the emission from C1 and V1 that allow us to characterize and identify individual single wall carbon nanotubes with actual sub-angstrom resolution. So unlike almost any other structural technique, uh, any other particle size characterization technique, this photoluminescence has considerably less than a, a nanometer 
potential resolution in terms of identifying and characterizing the molecular structure of a single wall carbon nanotube. Um, there's, there's kind of a, uh, an interesting history to the, the first observations of, of single wall carbon nanotube photoluminescence. So what I always like to start off with this slide is that carbon nanotubes, as they're basically synthesized, tend to, to basically form and, and clump together in ropes or strings like this. And it's because there's a lot of van der Waals forces, a lot of hydrophobic interactions. The, the carbon nanotubes basically form bundles. And even though it had been predicted many years earlier through Raman spectroscopy that a, a single wall carbon nanotube should exhibit photoluminescence properties, it wasn't until these seminal papers by the group of um, Bruce Weissman and, and uh, um, Richard Smalley at Rice University that photoluminescence was observed. And so the essence of the, of the real breakthrough for the observation of single wall carbon nanotube photoluminescence centers around this simple experiment. And what they theorized is that if they could actually surround the bundles of the carbon nanotubes with a detergent micelle and then sonicate that micelle, that they would be able to break and individually separate the single wall carbon nanotubes out of the bundle. So the bundles would actually disaggregate and then you would have individually micellized suspensions of the single wall carbon nanotubes that you could then centrifuge and separate from the, the gross bundles themselves. And it's these actual separated nanotubes that, that really led to the breakthrough and the observations that uh, allow us to characterize single wall carbon nanotubes with photoluminescence. So again, the original paper is, is based around that particular experimental sample preparation. And, it, and it's here also that the groundwork for the, the uh, application of this quadratic equation that, that characterizes carbon nanotubes based on these N and M characteristics, these N and M uh, parameters that we, we mentioned has, has come into play. Again, this is in 2002 um, with one of our, our Hariba uh, fluorolog instruments that measures in the near infrared. And another way of, of looking at that graphene sheet here in relation to uh, the introduction that I gave earlier is a little bit more detailed. Remember I mentioned that there are three families of single wall carbon nanotubes. You'll notice in this map that every third graphene cell in this particular map is blank. And that's represented by what we call the metallic single wall carbon nanotubes because they actually don't have photoluminescence properties. Um, only the metals and, and what we call semi-metals and semiconductors exhibit photoluminescence. And so again, the model N and M characterization of the single wall carbon nanotubes is based on the, the following parameters. Basically, as I mentioned before, a roll-up vector, which is a, a direction from the origin to the NM species of interest, and what we call the helical angle. And this helical angle is basically the difference between the horizontal axis and the maximum 30 degrees that a single wall carbon nanotube can actually roll up to form based on the constraints of, of the graphene sheet. And so this helical angle and, and roll up vector define the diameter and what we call the photoluminescence properties of this single wall carbon nanotube. So observationally, now we're getting down to a real look at some of the first measurements that were made. You remember I talked before about there being V to N to CN transitions, one being V1 to C1, which happens to be in the ultraviolet. So we actually ignore that in the analysis. We normally begin the absorption excitation measurements around 500 nanometers. And what's circled here in white is what we know called the, the lambda 2, 2, or the V2 to C2 transition of interest. And what you'll find here is that basically most carbon nanotubes, or basically all carbon nanotubes have an absorption uh, relating to this particular region. And again, as I mentioned, all fluorescence comes from the C1 to V1 transition. So what we do is we, we experimentally vary the color of light that's absorbed by the sample and we measure the color of light that's emitted by the sample in this type of simultaneous scan, as we'll uh, explain the instruments here in, a, in just a few minutes. So we can see that we can form and identify 
each NM species of single wall carbon nanotubes as a distinct peak in this excitation emission matrix. So this is a typical instrument that uh, is, is popular now for this type of measurement. So I'm basically just showing this for the, the scientific purposes of explaining how the, how the instrument works. Generally, you have a polychromatic white light source, typically a xenon arc lamp, or um, as we'll show later, perhaps a tunable tie sapphire laser. And then you have a monochromator that basically takes the polychromatic white light and depending on the, the grading um, angle, selects the color of light and basically rotates this grading to, to choose the color of light in a scan that ultimately excites your sample here in the sample compartment. And the sample photoluminescence can be measured at right angle or in front face in this particular case, but the end result is the photoluminescence, which is also polychromatic, basically is dispersed with this case being a, a, a um, high resolution spectrograph. So we take the, the fluorescence emission spectra of everything that's being emitted and we have another grading system which actually images, in this case, the entire spectrum on an array detector. So this particular array detector can, at each excitation wavelength, take a picture of all the emission wavelengths and scan through the um, uh, 3D map very rapidly. Of course, we have a number of, of different types of detectors available, and we'll be explaining at the end some of the significance of uh, one detector versus the other. Um, and, and the main thing has to do with, as I mentioned before, there are carbon nanotubes, as, as they get larger, basically their absorption and emission bands move further into the near-infrared, and so you actually need uh, a extended detector uh, to see that portion of the near-infrared, and we'll be explaining that um, in, in the upcoming slides. But again, the end result of the system is, is that we take the polychromatic emission and we image that onto the uh, array detector, which is the most efficient way of doing it, and we scan and take the, the emission map at each point in time, or at each, at each excitation wavelength. Okay, so just to kind of regroup here, um, even though it may not have been implicitly clear in the very beginning, and, and as we've got up to this point, there are several things here I like to kind of get back on the ground and, and make sure that, that we're all on the same page here. And that has to do with the fact that single wall carbon nanotube photoluminescence can be used to characterize um, several dimensions of the single wall carbon nanotube structure. Uh, the first, as I mentioned, being the diameter, the second being the twisting, the third actually being a, uh, a very big breakthrough um, having to do with the fact that you can also characterize the length. So with photoluminescence spectroscopy, you can actually have a full um, three-dimensional characterization of the nanotubes in terms of length, diameter, and, and the molecular twisting. And last but not least, you can also get size information about the, the size of, of nanotube bundles. Um, this is another interesting technique, uh, and I'll explain a little bit about the mechanism of this. But as I said, these are the four main parameters that are accessible with photoluminescence spectroscopy. Um, and so I think what I want to focus on here, of course, are the length and bundling applications first, because, you know, as, as you can imagine, those are um, not something that you would, you would have anticipated intuitively. Uh, but I guess since a very clever research has, has led to the, um, those additional parameters being available through photoluminescence spectroscopy. Uh, so again, just to recap, we have our diameter that you get through the absorption and emission peaks um, based on the quantum confinement rules and the fact that you know, there's generally a relationship for carbon nanotube diameter and their absorption and emission energy. The helical twisting, as I explained, um, in terms of their absorption and emission peak energies the length is actually a very important thing, and this has more to do with the, the um, what they call the extinction uh, of the absorption and the what we call the pristineness or the lack of defects of nanotubes as they're longer versus what happens to them when they get damaged during sonication and things like this. So in, in, in principle, the length observation has a lot to do with also uh, understanding the defect um, concentration and mechanisms associated with single wall carbon nanotube 
synthesis and isolation. So we'll uh, hit on those topics uh, a little harder as we move on. And then the bundling. Uh, again, something that people wouldn't have anticipated. But as I mentioned before, the metallic carbon nanotube species don't exhibit any photoluminescence. And in most cases, carbon nanotube bundles, when they get to a certain size, also have very weak photoluminescence uh, efficiencies. And this is due to a very complex, what we call, energy transfer mechanism between smaller tubes and larger tubes in the bundles that we'll um, um, explain here, here in, in the, uh, this first uh, talk. So this is actually a um, uh, uh, collaborative uh, piece of data that we have uh, also published as a technical note on our website that was um, published by the, the group of Tan and led by uh, Professor Andrea Ferrari of Cambridge University. And as we mentioned before, the isolation of, of single wall carbon nanotubes has everything to do with separating individual nanotubes from one another. As I mentioned before, when nanotubes are close to each other, they transfer energy to each other, and there's actually the, a, a very low efficiency of photoluminescence. So that was of interest to understand the efficiency of these separation techniques because there's a lot of research into what detergents to use and how stable they were. Um, you know, there's a lot of people focusing on isolating individual carbon nanotube species through this dispersal procedure. And so they want to be able to know, you know, understand the bundling characteristics. So in a, in a nutshell, what they did is they took a, a fresh dispersion and aged it over a period of several months here. And they identified, and it's, it's basically a, a little complex for this slide, but I have a more graphical representation in the next portion of this slide. They, they identified that, and as the tubes rebundled over time, this is sort of a reversible process. What happened is that as you excite smaller tubes, you observe luminescence from larger diameter nanotubes, and the, the ratio of the absorption and emission bands changes as a function of time, and that they'd actually confirmed this by using two photon excitation. That's using two photons to bring the carbon nanotube to the excited state, and then further observing this energy transfer from the, remember I mentioned the 1-1 one, one level and the 2-2 two, two level, this is the absorption band and the, the, the emission band, that you can actually transfer energy directly from one emission band to another in, a, in an energy transfer process. So it's the, the efficiency of this process at, that basically indicates the degree of bundling and hence the size of the carbon nanotube bundles. So in a nutshell, basically what it means is that you can actually identify when bundling has occurred by looking for the photoluminescence from larger diameter nanotubes as you excite the, the smaller diameter nanotubes. Okay, so as you can imagine, that there's a lot of applications for this in terms of identifying and, and basically um, optimizing the, the bundling and the storage properties of the nanotubes. Uh, again, the, the next major breakthrough, again, which was somewhat counterintuitive, um, was the length-dependent uh, optical effects in single wall carbon nanotubes. And again, another technical note and data that um, we've received, published, uh, received um, permission to publish from NIST, the work of Jeffrey Fagan and the group led by Eric Hobby, um, had to do with the fact that single wall carbon nanotubes, um, as they're dispersed, basically represent a distribution, more or less, of length. And the length dependent separation was actually discovered by mistake in the, in the Hobby Laboratory. Um, the, the story has it is that the iodixanol, which is the gradient dependent, you know, I mentioned before the separation gradient, that if you actually have too high a concentration of this iodixanol, what you end up doing is separating out the carbon nanotubes by buoyancy based on their, their length. So this typical preparation of carbon nanotubes can go from basically 10 nanometers to several hundred nanometers, and they can isolate these individual fractions with pretty, um, like I said here, narrow um, length distributions. And they can actually identify, and they've done independent characterizations in a number of, of um, studies along these lines uh, to say that they can do this. 
And what they found is that the absorption and the photoluminescence spectroscopy then allows them to identify based on the relative standardized intensity of the um, V1, C1 emission and the V2, C2 absorption bands here. Um, actually, this is the V3, C3 absorption, sorry. Uh, this absorption and emission bands basically uh, directly indicate the larger diameter nanotubes have an enhanced photoluminescence um, quantum yield and an absorption extinction coefficient as seen here in the next slide where you can actually characterize as a function of absorption. And again, the, the, the essence of this discovery has to do with the fact that the larger a nanotube is, the lower the fraction of what they call defects or broken graphene bonds that allows for a more efficient absorption and emission of, of the light energy. So the longer the nanotube is, the more efficient it is at being uh, a light absorber and the, the more intense its photoluminescence um, intensity is. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's also been characterization of carbon nanotubes by their absorption bands, um, and this being the a metal uh, carbon nanotubes tend to absorb here in the, the, the more ultraviolet. So what this is is a, is a plot of carbon nanotubes with increasing length distribution to show that the absorption bands and the uh, both the metallic and the other species um, basically represent and can be separated in terms of length. So not only is the photoluminescence spectra, but the absorption spectra shows the exact same length dependent distribution. And again, only the absorption spectrum and the Raman spectra uh, exhibit this metallic, um, these metallic species. So in order to, to get information for the larger diameter carbon nanotubes, as I mentioned before, larger diameter nanotubes are of interest because they can be used to, to be flattened as, into graphene. They also have a, a more efficient uh, work function. They're more desirable for a number of device applications. Larger diameter nanotubes, of course, have smaller band caps. That means they absorb light in a more red region and, and in a, uh, um, a more, uh, excuse me, they absorb and emit light more towards the near infrared. So what we found, and we've worked with, with several um, leading researchers here, is that the only way to actually measure the larger diameter nanotubes is to have a very efficient uh, a light source that's basically 100 times more powerful than the xenon light source. And the reason being, again, this, this requires uh, like, uh, you know, almost 1,000 milliwatts per nanometer for a matunable Thai sapphire laser, as opposed to the xenon lamp, which is basically tens of milliwatts. So essentially 100 times higher light energy is required. And that's because the extended detector basically has a lower quantum efficiency than the standard detector. And it just happens to be about a factor of 100 lower in efficiency, which is why we have basically set up a, this particular type of system, which is becoming uh, more and more desirable for people who are looking at the larger diameter carbon nanotubes. So you'll notice all of the same features here. Typically, we conserve the polychromatic white light source, uh, the monochromator that selects the color of light. Um, but we also have an additional tunable light source, this tunable tie sapphire laser that basically we can inject into the sample compartment and we can control the tuning you know, with our software and essentially um, basically come up with the exact same types of excitation emission wavelength maps. Uh, these, these larger diameter nanotubes basically are exciting between 700 and 1,000 nanometers, whereas the smaller ones generally excite from 500 to 800 nanometers. For that in order to differentiate between the two types of detectors, the standard and the extended detector. So again, an, an excitation through a tunable white um, continuous wave Thai sapphire laser uh, for the nanotubes that we measure with the extended end gas detector and the, the xenon conventional system for the standard end gas rate detector. And so this is a, uh, another piece of data that we um, received in collaboration from NIST, where they happen to actually be isolating large diameter carbon nanotubes. Basically, this is the, this particular lump here around 1,000 nanometers is the um, V2 to C2 or uh, transition. And basically, this is the emission region. So there's a, as a 
uh, an isoenergetic almost relationship across the band gap. So we have the you know the high energy absorption band, the the medium energy absorption band, which is we're exciting with the Thai sapphire laser, and basically what we you know are able to illustrate is that with this type of system, now the the larger diameter nanotubes basically you know come clear into into view um, with this particular type of excitation. Remember, this takes like a hundred times higher light intensity um, to collect the same type of excitation emission mapping information. And last but not least, um, we have you know followed along with the the model that was developed by Weissman in terms of identifying these single wall carbon nanotubes. And so we have a, uh, a software package that basically allows you to make these structural assignments for the individual carbon nanotubes. And it's based on a, a nonlinear least squares fitting um, algorithm, which we've licensed to uh, origin laboratories. So essentially with this, you can make, as we mentioned before, sub nanometer um, particles, diameter size measurements in addition to the, the length distribution and the, the helical angle distribution. Um, and again, this is something that um, we've, we've marketed and has met with uh, a lot of uh, market acceptance as you know a, uh, a valid way of um, looking at individual carbon nanotube uh, preparations and, and characterizing their, their helical and chiral and length dependent properties. Okay, so this brings me close to the end of my talk. And as I mentioned before, there's some, been some very exciting developments um, in single wall carbon nanotube uh, science over the past year. And again, this is, is something that uh, I review year to year. This has definitely been the biggest year in the past eight years in terms of what I consider to be major developments. As I mentioned before, at uh, IBM, basically what they found is that they've actually been able to build sub 10 nanometer carbon nanotube transistors, which again, the performance was actually um, higher than their uh, theoretical models had predicted. And so what they're basically uh, portending here is that this is going to be the next major breakthrough in the uh, Moore's law in terms of developing um, you know, higher uh, density and more efficient uh, um, transistor ne networks. Uh, another very interesting development from the discovery lab of single wall carbon nanotubes, that being of Bruce Weissman, as I mentioned before, is a type of paint that you can actually apply to a structural element sim similar to a, you know, a plain skin or bridge work or something. And, the, you know, the photoluminescence spectrum is very sensitive to the diameter of the carbon nanotubes. So wherever there's a crack or a stretching in the paint, you can actually also see with the photoluminescence a change in the absorption and the emission wavelengths. That quantum confinement principle basically allows you to pinpoint and identify areas through imaging of the near-infrared photoluminescence where this strain or crack might have occurred. So again, that was a very uh, interesting development, as was the, um, the, the formation of larger diameter nanotubes into the graphene sheet. So again, the structure, function, and size aspect relationship of the large diameter carbon nanotubes is something that's um, becoming uh, more and more um, prevalent in terms of research and I think something that um, again you know we're, we're very excited about. And uh, as I mentioned before the length of the carbon nanotubes and their pristineness and structure has a lot to do with how they're isolated and as I mentioned before there's a sonication treatment and what they found is that they've actually been able to see that single wall carbon nanotubes are actually broken and um, de you know, defect formation occurs through the air bubbles that are interacting during this, this sonication procedure. So now that they have an understanding, of course, of the mechanism of, of the damage, they'll be able to isolate the longer, uh, you, know, in, you know, increase the efficiency of isolating the longer, more pristine carbon nanotubes, which again will um, improve product development and speed things up along those lines. As I mentioned before, because people want to have um, the ability to isolate individual chiral species, basically what they've, they've done researching, and this is just one example, are ways of actually controlling formation of just one particular diameter of species. Again, this is like the holy grails to be able to isolate and grow carbon nanotubes at will with a given diameter and NM characterization. So again, big breakthroughs here.
are going to, you know, I think move things forward very rapidly. And also in terms of, you know, as I mentioned before, there's there's a lot of potential for carbon nanotubes in terms of biosensing and chemical sensing because their their near infrared emission is actually located in a, the region of of tissue that's transparent to light. And so there's a lot of, of efforts now in terms of generating biosensors that are non-toxic. And so one of the key problems was how do they sterilize these? I and mean, this is sterilization through gamma radiation going to influence the length of the carbon nanotubes. And so the, the breakthrough here was, again, in the Fagan laboratory at NIST, um, was that, yes, basically the, the length separated carbon nanotubes are very resilient and not susceptible to gamma radiation damage. And this, as I mentioned before, is another big breakthrough in terms of device manufacturing with single wall carbon nanotubes, is that they can actually be used to divert heat away um, from particular components in the device uh, through a process known as Joule heating. So essentially, um, this, this uh, carbon nanotubes can actually reduce the, the potential for damage from this type of, of mechanism in various devices. Um, a big breakthrough in terms of, you know, there's, there's physical, you know, with the photoluminescence imaging of tumors, but also photoacoustic imaging where you actually look at the sound waves of light. Um, so you excite it basically with light and you measure the, the, with a the microphone. And again, you can come up with a, a tumor image based on uh, carbon nanotubes that have been um, essentially, uh, what they call, functionalized with antibodies to recognize specific tumors. And so along these lines, this photoacoustic imaging is also something of, of a lot of interest. And um, one of our other uh, popular collaborator researchers has also discovered that uh, they can actually make, you know, affordable solar cells. So solar cell technology is moving forward based on the recent carbon nanotube work. Um, again, in terms of uh, flexibility and, and uh, um, affordability. And this is a kind of an interesting uh, story that in Australia they've actually um, worked to develop thin conductive solar cells that they can actually turn windows into uh, solar cell generators. So I thought that was a, a cute story. So with that, it uh, kind of brings me to the end of my talk. And, and if all this talk of carbon nanotubes and helical twisting hasn't made you dizzy, uh, I think if you stare at the blue dot, this will. Thanks for getting me ready for my lunch period in a little while. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. So I think Adam's now going to uh, change over to uh, allow Jeff Bodycomb to be the presenter. Go characterization, the size aspects of characterizing carbon nanotubes. So, um, Adam, if you're going into a change presenter there, please, and over to Jeff. I'm Jeff Bodycomb and I'm going to talk about using particle size analysis to characterize carbon nanotubes. Um, and so I want to thank Adam for his talk. I found it very interesting. I do not have the spinning graphic that he does in the beginning. Thank you. <laughs> I try. <laughs> okay, so um, you can characterize carbon nanotubes not just with uh, with spectroscopy, but also by a technique known as dynamic light scattering. So I want to start by discussing what is dynamic light scattering. And that really refers to the measurement and interpretation of light scattering on a microsecond time scale. And it's, it's a technique that's used to look at particle and molecular sizes because the size, the size scale it can probe is quite short. You can use it to look at size distribution and if you're interested in the physics of complex fluids, you can look at some of the relaxations and dynamics. Uh, that's not a very common application. Now, there are other light scattering techniques. Uh, there's static light scattering, which is re are really measurements over a duration of about one second. It's used for determining particle size, uh, particularly when particle diameters are greater than about 10 nanometers. You can use it for polymer molecular weights and second, second viral coefficients and radii of gyration. Uh, 
Another family of scattering techniques is known as electrophoretic light scattering, where you use the Doppler shift in the scattered light to probe the motion of particles due to an applied electric field. This is for really determining electrophoretic mobility and zeta potential. Effectively, the surface charge on a particle or the charge on a large molecule. To give you a little perspective, when we start thinking about particle characterization, and losing control of PowerPoint. We have a range of sizes, and you have a, uh, 100 micron particles, which you consider coarse. These are really powders. We move to the fine particles, below 10 microns. And then the colloidal and nanometric particles at below 1 micron. That's, those are some very rough rules of thumb. The, so if you think of applications, I mentioned the powders, suspensions, and slurries would be your fine particles. And macromolecules and carbon nanotubes really sits right around here. And there are a range of techniques for characterizing these kinds of particles physically. Um, I should add fluorescence after Adam's talk, uh, but really I think of for something in this size scale, electron microscopy, maybe some acoustic spectroscopy, uh, maybe laser diffraction, but it turns out DLS works nicely for carbon nanotubes as dynamic light scattering. And because the tubes are so narrow, light microscopy tends not to work particularly well. well what are we measuring in dynamic light scattering? Well, um, in the spectroscopy, we were looking at how uh, light interacts with the energy levels in, in the molecules. Uh, here, we're really looking at how the carbon nanotubes move. So particles in suspension undergo Brownian motion uh, due to solvent molecule bombardment and so effectively random thermal motion. This motion is random. It's related to particle size, which is what, uh, what we want. It's related to viscosity. That's something that's pretty easy to uh, measure or to know. And related to temperature, which again is very easy to measure and uh, you can even control it quite nicely. Now, dynamic light scattering signal looks like noise. So if I plot the intensity of the scattered light as a function of time on the Mercury second time scale, you can see the signal just jumps up and down like looks like random noise. And it is random, but it's not noise from detectors or lasers. It's actually due to the motion of the particles in suspension. And in this case, it's going to be the carbon nanotubes moving about. We can interpret noise with what's known as an autocorrelation function. So on the y-axis, I plot an autocorrelation function, and that's a kind of measure of random noise as a function of delay time. And for a single species, uh, you find out that this is an exponential decay with a decay constant. And that decay constant, you'll find out, is related to uh, particle diffusion and relate that to particle size through the Stokes-Einstein relationship. Of course, all that is on the next slide. So this is that gamma, that decay constant I mentioned in the previous slide, mutual diff diffusion coefficient, and Q squared, which is a scattering vector. It's a nice way of summarizing the scattering angle, the wavelength, and the refractive index of the liquid. So I have my diffusion coefficient, I can find hydrodynamic diameter here, Boltzmann's constant times temperature. So this I can look up, this I know for my measurements. Viscosity, which is a stiff function of temperature, and this is diffusion coefficient. Sorry for the mixed up notation. Um, note the effect of temperature. So if you're making measurements, you want to be very aware of temperature, not because of this temperature term up here, but because of the effect of temperature. On, sus uh, on suspending medium viscosity, which is quite strong. So I'd like to talk about hydrodynamic size. And this is particularly important for carbon nanotubes because the model most people use for characterizing particles by dynamic light scattering looks at hydrodynamic diameters and thinks about spheres. And carbon nanotubes are not spherical by any stretch or any small stretch of the imagination. You really get 
typically the diameter of a sphere that moves the same way as your sample. So if you have a sphere and it's decorated, made bigger by, say, a uh, stabilizing agent, we're going to see this entire expanded body. If you have a bunch of small spheres stuck together, some sort of strong aggregate, again, we're going to measure the aggregate. And if you have something ellipsoidal or tubular, uh, as shown here, the hydrodynamic size is going to be some mixed function of the diameter and length of the tube. Well, here's a slide I like to show using NIST data. So you can pick this data off of their website um, and on their description of the reference material 8011, which is uh, colloidal gold. And by microscopy, you're seeing sizes of about 8.5 to 10 nanometers. But if you go to dynamic light scattering, you see a size of 13.5 nanometers. So there's a huge difference. The DLS result is not wrong. It's measuring something different. It's actually measuring the colloidal gold with the citrate shell around it, the stabilizing the colloidal gold. And this 3.5 nanometers can be explained by the structure of the stabilizers. So that's some, something to keep in mind as you use DLS for analyzing any material. So uh, why would someone use dynamic light scattering? Well, there are a few reasons. It's very non-invasive. I can measure a suspension, and I can go and use, it, use that suspension for some other kind of measurement, for example, fluorescence. It generally requires only small quantities of sample. We can work with microliters of suspension, uh, at, well, as, as can Adam, now that I think about it, of, in the fluorescence. It's good for detecting trace amounts of aggregate. Uh, so if you start to have aggregation in your uh, nanotube sample, you'll pick it up first by dynamic light scattering. Uh, it's, and it's a good technique for this size range. Yes, I, I did reuse that slide. I can hear the chuckle from Mark. You can implement this measurement with, for example, the SZ100 from Hariba. And so there's a gratuitous instrument picture. But when I start talking about nanotubes, it's pretty clear that nanotubes are not spheres. Uh, otherwise, they would be buckyballs. So we have the tube and the name. So our mental model in dynamic light scattering is a nice round sphere. And a nanotube looks like this. So it's a tube that might be a little bit bent. So with these uh, carbon nanotubes, there are really two kinds of motion to think about. The first is translation. This tube starts here and starts moving off to the right. Another option is that this tube could start here and rotate. And in fact, what's really happening is that the nanotubes are doing both at the same time. They're both rotating and translating. And so in my discussion here, I'm going to ignore rotation. Sometimes you can pick it up by dynamic light scattering. Uh, but for now, we're going to ignore it. So what do I do? Well, I'm going to recognize that big tubes diffuse slowly, and that means I can compare it to small tubes. And so, great, if I have a, 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 diff, a probe of, of diffusion of my tubes, I can tell size fairly rapidly by dynamic light scattering. So it's fast and easy. But I'm also going to recognize that I just used the word tubes, and I can go find equations. This is one model for a, um, for a tube. And instead of t finding the translational diffusion coefficient as a function of hydrodynamic size, I'll look at it in terms of the length and diameter of the tube. So this model comes from uh, Nair, Kim, Bratz, and Strano. There is one issue with this approach. Le we have a length term and a diameter term, but I only know dt. So if the only data you have is dynamic light scattering, you're not going to get the length that you want or the diameter you want, but rather some mixed up uh, 
average of the two, which can be an inconvenience. It's a much bigger inconvenience if you don't recognize it from the beginning, which is part of the point of this talk. And so what we did to confirm all this is that we um, obtained some well-characterized uh, carbon nanotubes where we knew the aspect ratio is 1,000 and a diameter at somewhere between 0.7 and 0.9 nanometers. And we started making measurements by dynamic light scattering. We made six repeats and our average is 109 nanometers, standard deviation of 4.8 nanometers, and a coefficient of variation of 4.4%. Now this is the Z average diameter, so I'm using my model of a hydrodynamic size rather than talking about tube length and diameter, and so you'll keep that in mind. If I go and put these numbers back into this equation, figure the translational diffusion coefficient, and turn that translational diffusion coefficient in the, into hydrodynamic size, I really expect a value between 97 and 125 nanometers. And so this result of 109 is pretty close to these theoretical expectations. So what it tells you is that you can have a 700 to 900 nanometer long carbon nanotube. You'll go and measure the size in a DLS instrument, and it'll tell you about 100 nanometers. And the dynamic light scattering result isn't wrong. Uh, the assumptions in the equations don't fit what's really happening. And so if we go and add more information, that is the aspect ratio, and if we, um, we, we find out there's quite a nice match between the DLS result and what we expect from these materials. Now all the concerns about having a good dispersion and well-separated nanotubes are relevant in dynamic light scattering measurements. So here are some comments on how to make a good measurement of carbon nanotubes by dynamic light scattering. You want to make sure the sample is well dispersed. You want to ensure that the nanotubes are not colliding. You want to keep them, uh, keep a dilute suspension. Uh, since nanotubes are quite long, the, the odds of them running to, into each other are quite good. And you want to measure what's called the free diffusion, or as these nanotubes move about like they're in isolation uh, for the equations to work reasonably well. Use these results as an indicator of nanotube size or as an indicator of aggregation if you're interested in dispersion quality. Um, you, you really, if you keep that in mind, you can work with a hydrodynamic diameter and, and, and be quite happy. But if you go running to your boss and say, oh, I have a 100 nanometer long nanotube because the hydrodynamic diameter is 100 nanometers, that's uh, not a wise way to use the data. So you need to keep in mind that uh, better characterizations to say this particular formulation has much less aggregation. My overall size is smaller. Um, you may have some other knowledge about uh, aspect ratio and be able to implement some of the more advanced equations. Uh, but you can use this to indicate the tubes are getting bigger or that your dispersions are getting better or that your tubes are getting smaller due to sonication, for example. And we like to run other nano samples. I've run nano gold. I like to call nano iron oxide nano rust. Um, that's, that's what it seems like to me. Uh, smaller nano rods. And of course, the classic nanomaterial and the colloidal particle. Okay, so I think I can stop here and we can answer some questions. Thank you, Jeff, for covering the last part of the conversation for us. I can't help but ask, but does Nano Rust ever sleep? But you'd have to be a Neil Young fan to understand that. <laughs> Very little. <laughs> so um, we'll remind everyone, uh, there is the chat box in the uh, lower right-hand corner where we could type in questions like, uh, does Rust sleep? <laughs>
And if anyone has any questions they'd like to send in to either Jeff or Adam at this point, uh, we can wait a few moments and see if any questions arise. Okay. Um, one point that came up already is someone's asked for copies of slides. Um, I'm recording the presentation, and if the recording is done, works, uh, we should have this up on our website in about a week or so. Uh, and you know, I'm not sure the mechanism for for circulating slides, but I think there is one. So if you shoot us an email, uh, we'll see what we can do for you. All right, there's one on, is there, um, can someone send a file on nanotubes with antibodies for tumor binding? So I guess it's a question of do we have any data on that? Uh, Adam, have you seen any data specific to that? Oh, absolutely, yes. I think um, what I'd recommend is if they can email me directly, I can send them uh, more than a handful of papers, yes. Okay, thank you. And then um, I guess most people know that uh, Hariba Scientific is also involved with Ramon spectroscopy. And there's a question, I don't think there's a Ramon expert currently here among the Hariba group, but are there similar techniques using Ramon to determine length and the building of carbon nanotubes? Um, do either of you folks have any Ramon experience working with these samples? No, actually, yes. Um, I work with Angela Height Walker and Jeff Fagan of NIST, and they uh, the publication that I can forward uh, to Dr. Ortiz Lopez basically outlines the the use of absorption spectroscopy, photoluminescence, excitation emission mapping, and Raman spectroscopy. They all basically um, correlate with the length dependent properties as very similar to I did show the absorption, but there's also Raman correlations as well. And yes, bundling. Um, in terms of energy transfer, the, the, the same type of information is not available. It, it happens that the, uh, you know, Raman spectroscopy tends to not give you the same type of, of, of uh, specific information about bundling and rebundling as photoluminescence, so it's not as specific. Um, almost all carbon nanotubes, whether they're bundled or not, um, will exhibit the, the typical radio breathing mode, um, which relates to the diameter and the, the tubes breathing in and out, the graphene bands, and if there are defects or amorphous carbon, the, the G and D and G prime and D prime bands. So I'm very familiar with the Raman signals. But yeah, the information in terms of bundling is not as specific or quantitative as photoluminescence, but the length dependent properties are very similar. Okay, thank you, Adam. There is also a question. This is very specific to someone who currently has one of our products in Nanolog, kind of asking about uh, software upgrades. So that's probably something we could deal through an email. Um, the next question is: Considering aggregates of carbon nanotubes, how could one characterize these by either photoluminescence or dynamic light scattering? Do we each oh. get a shot at that one? <laughs> you each get a shot. Okay. Well. I'll go first in terms of, you know, the, the photoluminescence spectroscopy has a limited range of, in terms of aggregates of, of carbon nanotubes before the photoluminescence becomes too weak to measure. So during, you know, the, the, the entire observation, um, the, the chemical, uh, physical mechanics of, photo, of, the, of, of isolating photoluminescent species basically dictates that the as-is formed aggregates uh, are not viable in terms of a photoluminescent spectrum. Uh, back to the Raman, uh, generally aggregates are, are much more amenable to Raman spectroscopy in terms of size distributions and things like this as opposed to photoluminescence. Photoluminescence really only recognizes tubes that are pretty much individually isolated or very narrow bundles um, the, before the energy, you know, quenching effects become too strong. Okay, with, with particle characterization, um, th there are a few options depending on the size of your bundles. So um, I'll say as your bundles grow in size to on the order of a micron or, or, or a few microns, you can look at dynamic light scattering to see how big they get. And then you probably shift over to that technique like laser diffraction from significantly larger bundles. Uh, yeah, and 
now, so we can go and look at the bundles in using particle characterization tools. Uh, the only thing that we will be able to tell you is how big are the bundles. And so we won't get uh, some of the other structural information that you can get by fluorescence. So I can imagine using the particle characterization to find the right recipe for the isolated carbon nanotubes. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, now the next question is, uh, besides single-walled carbon nanotubes, are there other colloidal samples that we've used and uh, used photoluminescence mapping to look at other colloidal samples? I know you do a lot of dynamic light scattering of colloidal samples, but uh, Adam, what about photoluminescence of other colloidal samples? Any experience of mapping there? Um, well, yeah, typically the, the photoluminescence excitation emission mapping extends to a, a very wide array of other nanoparticles uh, known as quantum dots, zinc oxide. Um, so the aggregations and things there are not as a significant a factor. Um, so yes, there's, there's quite a few papers on photoluminescence excitation emission mapping for a very wide number of nanomaterials, including several of those in, in colloidal suspensions. Okay, thank you. Okay. And uh, at the moment, that was the uh, the last question we've had. We'll just wait uh, another minute or two before we uh, thank everyone for their time for attending today. Um, so if you do have any other questions, this is your last chance to uh, type them in to get a chance for a response here. Or you do see on the last slide here the email address of both Adam and Jeff. Certainly you're free to uh, send those questions uh, directly to them. And uh, for the people who we said uh, we'll get responses back to them, all these questions are recorded and uh, we'll get those to Jeff and to Adam to uh, respond to very specific questions. So I think if that's it, I think we uh, are probably done here today. We thank everyone for attending, for taking the time to attend. Thank you to Adam and to Jeff for presenting today. Yes. Uh, as you exit, often there will be an exit uh, questionnaire just to ask you some questions about the use of the software and the uh, ease of use of the uh, webinar software. If you'd like to participate in that, please let us know. And uh, with that, I think uh, we'll discontinue now. We wish everybody a wonderful rest of the day, and uh, thanks again for attending. Bye, yes, everyone. Thank, okay. thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. Goodbye.